how many reps should you perform per set? Does this change based on the training goal? And should you change the number of reps you perform for different exercises? The primary factor that will determine how many reps we perform is the load we use. It is pretty intuitive that when training with heavier loads, we can't perform as many reps, while lighter loads allow us to perform more reps. So, how heavy should we lift? This meta-analysis analyzed the body of evidence comparing the effects of different loads on muscle growth and strength gains. The researchers categorized interventions into those using light loads, defined as greater than a 15 rep max, moderate loads, defined as anything between a 9 to 15 rep max, and heavy loads, defined as an 8 rep max or heavier. For muscle growth, it was found that all load categories were effective for building muscle with no specific advantage for either. No significant differences were found between light versus heavy loads, light versus moderate loads, and moderate versus heavy loads. However, when it came to strength gains, there was a clear advantage favoring heavier loads. Heavy loads were superior to light loads, moderate loads were superior to light loads, and heavy loads were superior to moderate loads. So essentially, muscle growth can be achieved using a large variety of different loads. However, heavier loads are superior for increasing 1RM strength. So while muscle growth can be achieved using a large spectrum of loads, is there a point where the load is too light to be maximally effective? This was explored in this study, which compared the effects of training with different loads on muscle growth and strength. 30 untrained men performed single arm bicep curls and single leg leg presses to failure two times per week for 12 weeks. One arm and leg performed three sets to failure with 20% 1RM. The other arm and leg performed the same exercises with either 40, 60 or 80% 1RM. These limbs performed multiple sets to failure until they reached the same volume load as the limb training with 20% 1RM, which ended up being around 3 to 4 sets. It was found that cross-sectional area of the biceps and quadriceps increased similarly in the limbs training with 40, 60 and 80% 1RM, but achieved less growth in the limbs training with 20% 1RM. And in terms of strength, heavier loads resulted in superior increases in bicep curl and leg press 1RM. Training with 60 and 80% 1RM were superior for strength gains compared with 20 and 40%. So it seems that training with less than around 40% 1RM might result in less muscle growth compared with using heavier loads. A 40% 1RM is equivalent to around a 30 rep max load. So this is probably going to be pretty impractical to perform anyway. And for strength, heavier loads are superior, as we would expect. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Is there a point at which lifting too heavy can compromise muscle growth? This was explored in this study, which compared the effects of moderate versus heavy load training on muscle growth and strength. 19 men with an average of 4-5 to five years lifting experience performed 3 sets of the following exercises 3 times per week for 8 weeks. Half the subjects lifted heavy in the 2-4 to four rep range, while the other half lifted with moderate loads in the 8-12 to 12 rep range, with all sets taken to failure and load adjusted based on the target rep range in both groups. It was found that training with moderate loads resulted in slightly superior increases in muscle thickness of the biceps, triceps and quadriceps shown in the orange compared with the heavy loads shown in the blue. However, the heavy load training resulted in superior increases in 1RM bench press and squat compared with the moderate load training. So yes, it seems that training too heavy can compromise muscle growth. Lifting heavier than around a 5-6 to six rep max, or equivalent to around an 87% 1RM load, seems to be slightly less effective for building muscle. However, as expected, lifting heavier will likely result in superior strength gains. As we discussed, the load we use has the biggest impact on the number of reps we perform per set. However, this assumes that we are taking each set at least fairly close to failure. Because you could, for example, lift a 20 rep max load but only perform 10 reps, meaning you would have 10 reps left before failure. So how close to failure should we take each set? This was explored in this meta-regression, which analyzed the body of evidence looking at the effects of proximity to failure on muscle growth and strength. For muscle growth, a linear relationship was found between proximity to failure and muscle growth. In other words, training closer to failure results in greater muscle growth. Although for strength, there was essentially no notable effect of proximity to failure for increases in 1RM strength. 
So essentially, we want to take each set fairly close to failure, at least around 3 reps in reserve, to maximise muscle growth. This also means that the load we use will be the main variable dictating how many reps we perform. For strength however, proximity to failure doesn't seem to matter much if load is equated. Although when lifting heavy loads, you will inevitably need to train close to failure at some point to keep progressing. Since we will most likely be training somewhere close to failure in most cases, acute fatigue is likely to inhibit performance from set to set. If the same load is used and we train to the same proximity to failure, we will usually see a decrease in the number of reps performed on following sets. For example, let's say we were to perform 3 sets of dumbbell bicep curls with 10kg, taking each set about 1 rep before failure and resting 90 seconds between sets. On the first set, let's say this lifter gets 12 reps. Then on the second set, they might perform 11 reps, since they are somewhat fatigued by the previous set. And on the last set, they perform 9 reps. This decrease in reps is expected since acute fatigue inhibits performance on subsequent sets. And in most cases, greater performance decreases are expected when training with higher reps and shorter rest periods, while less performance decrease is expected when training with lower reps and longer rest periods. The point being to just be aware that you don't necessarily need to perform the same number of reps each set. If you were training close to failure, rep decreases are expected from set to set. And if you want, you can reduce the load on latter sets if you aim to maintain a specific target rep range. Another factor influencing how many reps we perform is the specific exercise we perform. Some exercises are naturally better suited to different rep ranges. While there are no hard rules, free weight compound exercises like squat, deadlift and pull up variations are usually better suited to lower rep ranges and therefore heavier loads. This is because they have a greater amount of total musculature involved to both move the weight and to stabilise other joints. So higher rep ranges will generally be more taxing on the cardiorespiratory system, which could 1. result in the cardiorespiratory system limiting performance before the target muscle, or 2. require much longer rest periods to allow the cardiorespiratory system to recover, making training sessions less time efficient. While for most isolation lifts, both lower and higher rep ranges can be suitable. However, some people find that lifting heavy loads for some isolation lifts places too much tension on a single joint and tends to irritate the joint or connective tissue. In these cases, it might be more suitable to train with higher rep ranges to minimise injury risk. Furthermore, you might change the rep range for different exercises depending on the purpose of that particular exercise in the training program. In some cases, you may have exercises that you want to maximise strength for. For these exercises, you would probably want to train with heavier loads and lower rep ranges, around 5 reps and less most of the time. Other exercises might be performed for hypertrophy purposes, either to assist your strength lifts or simply for the sake of building bigger muscles. In this case, you probably want to train somewhere within the effective hypertrophy rep ranges, somewhere within the 5 to 30 rep range. Going back to something we mentioned earlier, the rep ranges we train with can also influence joint pain and irritation. Generally, heavier loads tend to result in greater joint stress and increase the likelihood of pain and injury, while lifting with lighter loads tends to be a little more joint friendly for most people. This was indirectly observed in this research review which compared the injury rates of various strength sports. Bodybuilding had by far the lowest injury rates, while Strongman and Highland Games had the highest. While there are many variables at play here, one factor that likely contributes to the low injury rates in bodybuilders is the fact that they don't need to lift heavy, which the other strength sports do. So essentially, if you are experiencing joint or connective tissue pain in a specific region, then it might help to train with higher rep ranges. This will allow you to lift lighter loads while still providing an equivalent hypertrophy stimulus. Although if you were required to reduce load for a lift you aim to get stronger at, then you would want to eventually get back to lifting heavy with lower rep ranges after the pain has subsided. The number of reps you perform is also a way to implement progressive overload into a training routine. Progressive overload is simply the idea that we want to make training more challenging over time, so the stimulus continues to be disruptive enough to elicit an adaptation. 
There are many ways to implement progressive overload, but the primary methods from a session to session basis are to try and increase the load you lift and or the number of reps you perform. Going back to our previous example using bicep curls, let's say a lifter was to perform three sets of curls, taking each set one rep before failure with 90 seconds rest. In the first week, they performed 10 kilograms for 12, 11, and nine reps respectively, as per our previous example. The next week, reps might increase by one or two across the three sets. And over time, total rep performance should increase slightly. Eventually, you might reach an upper rep range, which is up to your discretion, and decide to increase load. With this heavier load, you won't be able to perform as many reps. But once again, you can slowly increase reps over time as the muscle becomes bigger and stronger. So far, we have been discussing reps in the context of traditional training. However, there are some other training styles, known as metabolite techniques, which might change the specific number of reps you perform in a given set. Metabolite techniques don't have a specific definition, but they can generally be described as those which utilize some combination of short rest periods, lighter loads, and a close proximity to failure. Some examples include drop sets, myo reps, rest pause, and pre-fatigue. Essentially, the idea is to accumulate a high number of reps while the target muscle is in a highly fatigued state, sometimes known as effective reps. It depends on exactly how they are implemented, but overall, most metabolite style training methods seem to be highly effective for muscle growth. For example, this study compared the effects of two different metabolite techniques versus traditional training on muscle growth. 28 trained males with an average of 5 years lifting experience performed the squat, leg press, leg extension, stiff leg deadlift, and seated leg curl two times per week for eight weeks. One group trained using drop sets, another trained using rest pause, and the third with a traditional training approach. After eight weeks, lateral thigh muscle thickness increased similarly in all groups, with no significant differences when summating all the regional measurements. So if we are performing metabolite techniques, the number of reps we perform might be different compared with performing traditional straight sets. For example, let's look at myo reps. Myo reps are when you perform one standard set of around 10 to 15 reps or so, taken to or close to failure, known as the activation set. Then you rest for around 15 to 30 seconds before performing another myo rep set with the same load taken to or very close to failure. You then repeat these myo rep sets until you reach a target number of total repetitions or for a predetermined number of sets. So for each myo rep set, you are probably only going to be able to perform around three to six reps or so, since rest periods are limited and acute fatigue is therefore high. In this case, the rep range you are targeting is not going to be the same as if you were performing traditional straight sets. With all this information, let's make some practical recommendations. The primary variable that will influence how many reps we perform is the load used. Heavier loads mean we can't perform as many reps, while lighter loads mean we can perform more reps. The number of reps we perform each set might also change from set to set due to acute fatigue. And we might increase the number of reps performed with a given load as a form of progressive overload. So how many reps should we be aiming to perform? To maximize muscle growth, we can train anywhere within the approximate 5 to 30 rep range and achieve equal hypertrophy on a per set basis. Although practically speaking, I don't think you need to go above around 20 reps in most cases, as very high rep training can make sessions take longer and can make it more difficult to gauge your proximity to failure. The exact number of reps within this range doesn't seem to be all that important as long as we are taking each set fairly close to failure, at least around 3 reps in reserve. To maximize strength however, heavier loads are superior, which therefore means lower rep ranges. Training with around 5 reps or less seems to be the best way to maximize strength for the specific exercises you want to get stronger at. Furthermore, you might adjust the number of reps you perform for different exercises, depending on whether they are compound or isolation lifts, and if they have a strength focus or a hypertrophy focus. You might also adjust the rep ranges you lift with as a way to manipulate load to minimize joint stress. Generally, higher reps, meaning lighter loads, are going to induce less joint stress, which might be helpful at times when you are experiencing joint pain. And lastly, it should be noted that these recommendations are all within the context of traditional straight set training. 
The number of reps performed per set might be a little different when using metabolite training techniques such as drop sets and myo reps. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.